I knew I had a hard task ahead of me. I did not go into this naive. Not, not all the things that I thought would be hard um, were hard, and things that I didn't expect to be hard ended up being harder. I did not expect the um, sort of, that there would be so many people who were working to undermine the message of science, the message of public health, um, nefarious actors who really were working to undermine what good health would look like for individuals and for the country. That was harder than I thought it would be. Given what we have now, the vaccines, um, you know, natural immunity from people who are getting exposed and infected as well, and now drugs, as you mentioned, uh, should we be in a much better place than we are now in terms of the pandemic, or are we where you would think we should be um, two and a half years, three years into the pandemic? Uh, well, I would say we are in a much better place than we were, for sure, with over 95% of people having immunity of one flavor or another, and many people have immunity both related to prior vaccination or prior infection. Um, so a lot of protection out there. But we also know, as with all respiratory viruses, they are likely to circulate some. Um, they may very well circulate a little bit more over the fall um, when respiratory viruses tend to thrive. And we at CDC will continue to be vigilant to get the message out um, of all the things that people can do to protect themselves. And I think the public now knows what those things are. Vaccine mis and disinformation, I think, in general, undermining you know what we were working to do to get people out of the pandemic, to get people um, protected, um, and now also pediatrics, you know, bled into pediatric vaccination as well. And so, you know, when vaccine is such a cornerstone of what we do in prevention and in prevention of infectious threats, and that by its very nature, not just in COVID but in other things, is being challenged. I, I don't know that we could have rewound the clock two and a half years ago and said this incredible thing that we were celebrating with um, how well this vaccine worked and how this was really going to be among the most important things to get us out of this pandemic, that that would in somehow turn into people weaponizing it for political gain. When it comes to messaging with COVID-19, we really had um, messages from from a group, right? The, the briefings came from the White House. Um, Dr. Fauci at NIH, um, HHS, and sometimes the Surgeon General, as well as yourself, you know, as director of the CDC. How did that decision to make it a group, you know, briefing versus, you know, did you argue, for example, that the CDC should be the voice, that there should be a single voice, and would that have helped in terms of reducing some of the confusion and the misperception there if the public had kind of one place to go? Um, yeah, I think in retrospect, one could say that, you know, how did, how, how was the, how were those decisions made? It was intentional because very much we were all on the same page and we wanted to make sure that America heard that all of us were on the same page, that the scientists at NIH and the Surgeon General and HHS and CDC agreed. We were in agreement with the things that we were saying. And that unif unifying message, I think, is really critically important, especially when um, the other message out there was, this is confusing. So we really wanted to have one voice, one scientific voice from the scientific agencies. You have said that something like COVID-19 is too big for a single agency like CDC to manage alone, um, and that you know you can't make a there can't be a good solution in isolation, like an agency can't act in isolation. I wonder if you can comment on and help the public better understand what the CDC can and cannot do. You know, I think a lot of the criticism of the agency has come from expectations that the public had, you know, on what the CDC should be doing or telling them. Um, I wonder if you could help us understand a bit, like a better understanding of what the agency can do and what it can't. I really appreciate this question because I think that this is lost on not only everyday, you know, the American public, but even scientists who are engaged in asking for, for things from CDC. So I, I guess, and this is among the things we're doing so much work in CDC moving forward, but among the things that we're asking for congressional help on so that we can be a nimble agency. Um, we have real challenges in our workforce and the authorities that we have in our workforce. Our ability to pay overtime 
our ability to pay danger pay. If we have an employee that is working in an Ebola-laden district, um, you know, helping a community, we can't do those sorts of things. It is very hard to be nimble with and be a response-based workforce when we don't have the capacity the way other response-based agencies have. So workforce is a real challenge. The other one is data. Um, we do not, we receive data voluntarily at CDC. Volunta we have um, 3,000 jurisdictions that send us data. Sometimes it's standardized, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it comes by fax, sometimes by email, sometimes by web. Um, so there are lots of different ways that we receive data and we cannot compel that data, those data to come to us. Um, during the public health emergency, we were able to get more data because of the public health emergency. But one of the things I really have come, become accustomed to saying is when people ask, we want to see the data from CDC, please also ask the question, does CDC actually out get the data that you're looking to get from CDC? Because oftentimes we don't. Um, and that is really, we, we want those data to come in in a privacy protected way. We don't want in individual information. But we do want to be able to say, in jurisdiction X, there's an outbreak next to you in jurisdiction Y, you should be looking for it too. Um, if those data don't come to us in CDC, we can't send it back out to, to jurisdictions and to state and local health departments. And you helm the agency at, you know, as we said, a very historic moment. And arguably, we're kind of at the tail end of that now. Why did you decide now was the time to step down? Well, so it's been it's been an extraordinary tenure. Um, when I came in, it was really about getting the agency, the country, and the world out of the darkest days of the pandemic. Um, we have been conquering a rate of infectious threats, I think, unlike any we have seen throughout history. Um, certainly, I knew I was coming in to conquer COVID-19. Um, and also monkeypox came, um, our first a case of paralytic polio in the country, um, a Sudan Ebola outbreak in Uganda, two Marburg outbreaks in Equatorial Guinea and Tanzania. The rate of public health threats has really been um, enormous over the last two and a half years. One of the other things that we really did um, during my tenure was CDC moving forward. Um, and that is sort of our strategy and plan for how do we take where we are in public health at CDC and across the country and pivot to be the public health agency of the future. What is it that we, the lessons that we learned, CDC has been around only for 76 years. They weren't around for the last pandemic. Um, so what is it that we have learned and how do we become the public health agency that the America deserves and desires? Um, and so we did a lot of that work over the last year, and I feel like I've charted the course now for what we need to do in the future. Much of that work has already been accomplished and is, is ongoing. Um, and you know what became very clear to me was that this work will take longer than a year. It'll take longer than two. We need to be able to be adaptable um, as new science, new needs emerge. And so it, important to me was to have a legacy where I talked about what do we need to be doing. What is the, this inflection point, and so we've launched that. But I also think that we have done a lot of work in the agency to demonstrate where, you know, where we can fill voids in communication and fill it with important scientific information so that when that void is there, that we've filled it before some nefarious actor may come in and fill it for us. Um, and so I think that that has been critically important. This is going to be something that we have to keep a very close eye on because there are people who um, very much want to undermine, and it's not just CDC and it's not just NIH, it is all of academia and all of science that is really struggling with this right now.